Okay, so we're live and uh, welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly webinar with football practitioners from around the world. Um, today, uh, our topic matter is going to be Talent ID and I'm joined by two uh, fantastic practitioners. Uh, Chris Casper is the Sporting Director of Salford City. And for once, we're sort of dipping our toe outside the world of football and sort of welcoming Gary Bamford from Duratus UK as a former Sergeant Major with uh, Special Forces and certainly on his experiences there that we'll be looking at today. Um, before I introduce you correct, uh, fully to the, uh, to the guys, I'll just sort of share with you what our plans are for today so that you can uh, filter your questions through to the guys. I'll just share my screen with you on that. So today we're uh, looking at evaluating the intangibles in talent ID. Um, so very much in the first half of the discussion, we'll be looking at how in their roles, Gary and Chris are sort of assessing potential of, uh, of uh, the players they're looking at and identifying what are the key traits that they're looking at. So um, yeah, in terms of their sort of the character and the personality, Sort of looking more at the, the human rather than the, the performance side of things. Um, looking at their backgrounds, players, players' experience, sort of their, their training backgrounds, and sort of very much on this idea of sort of the objective judgment versus the, the subjective. Um, once then they've uh, had a good look at the, the individuals in question, then what is that final decision making process? And again, Where's that final evaluation come from? How they evaluated those key traits that they've identified, very much the intangible side of things that there's not clear sort of data measures for those, how they embrace or, or limit subjective thinking. And then basically that, who has, who has that final decision? What is that final decision process? Is it come down to one person or is it become a, a collective decision? Um, so before we can, get to all of that. Let me first of all introduce you to the two guys. So uh, we'll start with uh, Chris, Chris Casper. Um, it's great to have you with us. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, Chris, one of you could just tell us a little bit about your professional background in football and obviously leading up to your current role as um, the sporting director at Salford City. Yeah, well, I come from a footballing background. My dad was a footballer for Burnley in the 60s and 70s, so I was always emerged in the footballing culture. Saturday was always football day. Um, so you know, he then went on to become a coach and a, a manager at Bury and Burnley as well. So I'd say I was always emerged in the football culture. I went to a very sporting school uh, in Burnley uh, that really promoted sport, football, cricket, which I was very passionate about. Uh, and when I was 14, I was spotted playing for the town team uh, by a Manchester United scout called Joe Brown, who invited me to, to United for trials. Um, and when I was 16, I signed a four-year contract, two-year apprenticeship and two-year pro for, for United. Um, played in the 1992 FA Youth Cup winning team, the class of 92 team, I suppose they'll call it. Um, and then the year after, uh, Captain England, the under 18 level, uh, we won the European Championships in, in England as well. So, uh, in the youth part of things, uh, you know, quite successful, really, merely part of my career. Uh, I made my debut for United at, at 19 in the League Cup game against uh, Port Vale. Um, but with the way that the club was going, a uh, lot of success. Uh, and the, the, the manager was, um, you know, absolutely. Uh, obsessed with 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 winning and building the club, which was right, absolutely, you know, hundred percent right. He's got an obsession for it, which, um, you know, it, it, it kind of it spread throughout the club. <clears throat> the his passion, uh, his character, um, you know, and his will to win was, was fantastic. Um, and he did sign some very, very good players, Yap Stam and Ronnie Johnson, good defenders, and obviously Wes Brown came through as well. So I found my uh, found my chances limited. Um, so when I was 23, I moved to Reading, I was transferred to Reading. Uh, when I was 24, 
uh, Boxing Day 99, I suffered a, a pretty bad uh, uh, leg break, uh, knee injury and ankle injury, all, all in the same tackle, uh, which unfor unfortunately forced me to uh, retire two years later. Um, I went straight into coaching. I coached at Bath University uh, and a team called Team Bath. Um, then came back up north to, uh, my, uh, to, to become the youth team coach at Bury. Uh, and when I was 30, I, I got the opportunity to manage the first team at Bury for two and a half years, which I really enjoyed. Uh, it gave me a lot of experience. Uh, I was very young at the time and like I said, not a lot of experience, but it was a learning on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which was great for me. Um, I then went to work. I left Bury, uh, two, like I said, two and a half years later, uh, and then went to work at <coughs> Wigan, for, uh, who were in the Premier League at the time, doing some scouting uh, for Steve Bruce, um, and then had uh, a role at Bradford in the youth team. In the first team role at Grimsby for a, for six months before I worked for the Premier League for six and a half years uh, in the youth department. We developed a system called the Elite Player Performance Plan, which we delivered into the clubs. Um, I also developed a, a coaching program called the Leadership Journey, uh, which was one-off events throughout the, the country, which coaches from clubs could come along to, looking at different aspects of coaching, not just the technical stuff that the football uh, the, the FA were delivering, but you know, different kinds of, uh, of coaching, personal and professional skill development as well. Um, and then, uh, like I say, I had six and a half years with the Premier League uh, and then was offered the role of sporting director at, at Salford City uh, three and a half years ago, which kind of encompasses a lot of the experiences that I've, well, I've, I've gained throughout my career. Um, but I'm still learning, like I say, on a day-to-day -day basis and currently doing a a master's degree in it at uh, Salford University. So um, that's my background, really. Very sporty background, very football orientated. But, um, you know, this, I say this role encompasses a lot of the experiences that I've had throughout my career. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Chris, for sending me uh, diving a little bit deeper into, into the work you're doing at Salford and, and particularly around, around recruitment. Um, sort of now, sort of bringing bring, bring in Gary Bamford. Gary, it's great to have you with us this morning. Oh, really grateful to be here, to be honest, Steve. Yeah, thanks very much. Welcome, everyone, as well. Um, yeah, so I guess a little bit more about me than has already been said. Um, just listening to Chris there, it's, it's quite interesting, really. I mean, again, a lot of my younger days, I was, I was heavily involved in sport. Um, not just one sport, to be fair. I, I, I competed in probably five or six sports to a fairly decent level. I was... I was okay at a lot. I was, I was not excellent at any, I don't think. Um, but I just enjoyed competition and, and challenge first and foremost, I think. Um, end of my sort of school education, uh, college, I, I volunteered to join the Royal Marines and spent about five years in the Royal Marines, uh, thoroughly enjoying my job and the excitement and adventure that came with that, I guess. And then uh, as some people on the call, I'm sure will remember where they were. Um, the Twin Towers attack happened and um, I remember where I was when the Twin Towers attack happened. I was serving in the Royal Marines and, and if I'm honest with myself, probably feeling like my career was coasting a little bit rather than uh, and advancing. And I, and I certainly saw that as an opportunity. Well, rightly or wrongly, um, if, if I was to make a difference to what just happened on the TV, then the only place I could see to do that was, was probably Special Forces. And uh, so that led me down a path to volunteer for the Special Boat Service. Um, this was back in 2003 and I spent... I spent the next 16 years from uh, post 9-11 um, being involved, heavily involved in operations um, within the Special Boat Service and, and Joint Special Forces operations. Um, again, had a very, very interesting career as far as my sort of um, former colleagues would have experienced within that organisation. Things changed so much on a, on, a, on a yearly basis. What we were doing was was incredibly varied and different from the former times. And so, um, you know, I, I learned an awful lot through that. Again, I, I sort of rose to the rank of Sergeant Major um, towards the end of my career. Uh, and again, which for those that aren't aware, puts me in charge of between 50 and 100 people, uh, depending on what group I'm, I'm working with. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a grey bearded position, really, yeah, a, a term we use quite a lot of uh, you are the, the voice of reason to some of the uh, younger 
more maverick kind of personalities that are coming in, uh, you know, and, and the kind of sounding board for a lot of ideas. Um, towards the end of my career, I was heavily involved in recruitment um, and talent ID, um, which is one of the reasons I'm here today, I guess. Um, and um, again, a job that I thought on the face of it, that I wasn't really going to enjoy. I'd been very operationally focused for my career and wasn't particularly enthused by um, initially with going into a role such as that. But on, in hindsight, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed the role of the kind of mentor inside of it and, and, and moving uh, on these journeys with uh, potential aspirants and, and, and getting them into the organisation that I'd spent most of my adult career and so uh, and formed some great relationships um, through that as well. So um, I guess that led me into kind of towards the end of my career, a junction really, I could have extended, I could have carried on. I was dead set on leaving the military and and now I've moved into a very similar role, to be perfectly honest, um, creating my own business, um, as, as you mentioned, Steve, um, Duratus UK. Um, and I do a number of things. One of the primary things I do is, is one-to-one coaching and mentoring with um, people that want to optimise their performance, ultimately, um, whether that's from a sporting background or corporate background. Um, uh, and again, thoroughly enjoy that. Um, uh, and, and, and part of what I do also is, is working with sports teams or corporate teams on just helping those teams gel better together from, from my learnings over, over my career. Um, I'm sure we'll unpick some of that uh, in sh- shortly. Yeah, we most most definitely will, and yeah, and, and thank you. Yeah, you you took to uh, to that recruitment role, or else, uh, yeah, like you say, that's uh, that's what where the main focus is going to be today. Um, um, I guess now is probably it, it's as good a time as, as ever. Then we'll sort of have a look at look at those uh, recruitment processes. Um, and if we do a, a coin toss in terms of uh, who who wants to who wants to go first and sort of reveal what those uh, recruitment processes look like. Gary, you go first. <laughs> I lost the towing cost. That's fine. <laughs> no, I'll just share this screen then. Again, so I've, I've, uh, I've thrown this together, um, and I've added some probably sexier pictures than, um, you know, just trying to um, balance out my my information really, just to try and paint a picture. So uh, this this would be again this must caveat all this was this is my, this is it's a simplified form, and this is me explaining to you this by no means is the official MOD um, uh, information that is is clearly much more complex but I can add a certain amount of detail to this um, conscious of um, there's there's various parts of it that I'm I'm not going to be able to disclose but this is all um, pretty much open source now and um, so ultimately there's the as you see there the the, the main three arms of the, the MOD the army the Navy in effect and the RAF, um, uh, both or all three special forces tier one units, if you like, um, it's broken down into a number of units now, but there's, there's three primary units and they all recruit from all three um, arms of the, of the MOD. Um, and each, any aspirant, any recruit um, volunteers themselves. That's, that's a key point uh, you know, people aren't, um, necessarily uh, handpicked at any earlier stage. People have to volunteer themselves. And, uh, and in my intro, certainly there was an impetus for me with what happened in world events. And, and quite often in people's lives, there's a point where we can have some influence there on, on whether they think, uh, uh, I say we, uh, former career, um, can have an, an effect on people. And but the first step that they've got to do is is put their paperwork in for a special forces briefing course, that SFBC that you see there. Um, now, over the years, this has taken a number of um, designs, I guess um, you could say. Um, I, I won't go into detail of what the current design is, but ultimately it's a, it's a five-day event um, um, based out of the Brecon Beacons where people have, have, have volunteered. There's a number of criteria they've had to have met, things like they've got to have had two years minimum service within the military. Um, They've got to have a a pretty good disciplinary record. We're not looking for angels, but we're not looking for villains equally. So uh, there's a a military category to that. Um, They've got to have, um, or should have 
um, uh, an endorsement from their chain of command. Again, this is just another filter. So we've got a number of filters that build in there and they've got to be below a certain age again, but that changes. So I wouldn't want to give you some incorrect information. Um, and there's some gray area with that as well. But uh, so they volunteer for a special forces briefing course and, and come on. And there's a number of guys that run um, from representing each of the units respectively that uh, manage and oversee that, that five day event. Um, and, you know, it's an arduous course. There's, there's no long and short of it. They're, they're going to be tested physically, mentally. Uh, their, their skills and attributes are, are going to be uh, lent on and they're going to have to perform to a relatively high standard. And, and there is lots of objective assessment during that. There's also uh, a fair amount of subject, subjective assessment by the, the cohort of um, directing staff that, that manage that course also based on their experiences. And we can go into that as you see fit. On the back of um, a special forces briefing course success, um, so that's important. People have to be recommended to go on to their respective selection process. So the SAS and the SBS would go on to UK special forces selection as it's known, and then SRR, Surveillance Reconnaissance Regiment candidates would go on to their uh, Surveillance and Reconnaissance um, uh, Regiment selection process also. Um, uh, again, the, select, the UK SF selection process is joint for both the SAS and the SBS. Um, so whether whichever candidate you're, you're, you're respectively going, or which respective unit you're going for, the, uh, all candidates are looked on uh, the same and that that is almost a, a bias that's taken out of uh, the process actually um, which unit is, is kind of irrelevant information on the on the whole um, and it's a six month process again again we'll go into a little bit more detail um, of, of what again an incredibly arduous course um, I'm massively biased I would say it's up there with the hardest courses in the military in the world um, you know again I, I'm not I've compared notes with lots of Navy SEALs, uh, Rangers, Delta, et cetera. And, and you know, it's right up there uh, for various reasons. Um, but it's very broad in what it's looking at and what it's assessing. So um, the, whilst the, the term is special forces, actually we're looking for very general skills, actually in a broad range of skills because of the variety of the careers and the expectations that we're looking for. But I think most important, and I'm sure we'll come back to this as well, uh, one of the things that we're looking at it for primarily is potential. We're not looking for the finished article. Um, the finished article comes when they, they move on through their careers uh, into the various different units. So, uh, uh, and I guess the argument is, are, are we ever a finished article to be fair? Um, the, the primary um, filter, I guess, is the first few weeks of the selection process. It's it's three weeks long now, uh, not to swing the lantern at all. It was it was four weeks in my day, um, um, but um, but whether that's easier or harder, that that's a, that's a very subjective thing. Um, to try and squeeze all this, what they do now into three weeks is incredibly challenging. So, but just for context, it has reduced over the years, um, but in days, not necessarily in distance. Um, and, and what the picture demonstrates there is, is what's expected of people. It is there's two courses a year. There's one in summer and one in winter. Um, and and I, could, I could give some thoughts on, on that in a minute, but primarily they have heavy weights on their backs, um, uh, weights that they would be expected to carry on operations, and they're covering somewhere between 20 and 30 kilometers a day. So. You know, the speed, there's, a, there's very objective um, tests and speeds that they've got to uh, meet. They don't know at the start of the day how long the day is going to be. They don't know at the start of the day when it's going to end. Um, they just go from checkpoint to checkpoint and eat, eat, at each checkpoint they're either given a new grid reference and they've got to move, continue on to it, or they're told to jump on the, uh, the transport because they're going back to camp. So um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of time in your own head as to and filling in the gaps ultimately and that's that's one of the big screens so on a on a typical selection course i'm going to give some very broad numbers here there might be a hundred people starting um, it wouldn't be unusual to lose uh, maybe two-thirds or three quarters of the course in the first three weeks through this process um, having been the man that receives all the people that have been on and, and have subsequently been unsuccessful <clears throat> i've heard every excuse under the sun 
um, with regards to why people have been unsuccessful uh, in this process. Um, and again, I've got some plenty of deep thinking on that if we want to scratch that a little bit more. Um, preparation is normally uh, the main reason why people are unsuccessful. Um, <coughs> and even that, there's a lot of detail to that preparation um, word in itself. Um, uh, and clearly there's a lot of uh, injuries that, that prevent people carrying on earlier again but that partly can be sometimes put down to poor preparation um, there's no most people going onto this course can get experience or can get information about exactly what they're going to be faced with so there's no real there's not a, a, a void of information within the, the right circles as to what to be expected but what's important to note there is most of the people that you will engage with around this which is a pretty horrific uh, three weeks for most people, um, it's very challenging indeed, um, is you're often speaking to people that have tried it and failed. So you get in a very negatively biased um, or overemphasized over over kind of a degree of difficulty because, again, the protection of their ego, et cetera, for having been unsuccessful. And, and again, there's, there's various different things we can talk around that. So that's the first three weeks. They'll then subsequently get a little bit of training through uh, the selection process um, before they fly out to uh, the jungles of, of northern Borneo, Brunei. Um, and again, um, there's not many pictures inside the jungle because it's such a difficult place to work and operate. Now, I chose this one because it's it's probably the only time it's the it's the insertion and expel that's kind of the way in and out of the jungle. You go there for six weeks, and what you see in the bottom corners of the screen actually is is where you go and live for the next six weeks. Um, uh, and it's and it's pretty difficult. Um, again, it's there's there's probably between again very broad brush numbers, but the, um, there's going to be between 15 and 40 odd people going out at this stage, depending on the size and how successful the, the first hill selection part is. Um, and um, the point of this uh, exercise uh, is to take people out of their comfort zone. Whilst the Brecon Beacons is very challenging, it's the UK weather, it's the UK environment, it's it's something that a lot of people kind of prepared and, 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 and have a, num a certain amount of expectation towards most people going um, most candidates going into the jungle won't have experienced something like this before um, and it forces them to lean on their attributes as opposed to their inherent skills really so the things that they may have been competent in, competent in in their careers up to this point um, that they are so far removed from that they have to lean on their attributes of uh, self-discipline personal resilience, their own leadership qualities, etc. And we can scratch around that as well. But ultimately, taking them out of their comfort zone for such a long period of time, we can really, the, the directing staff that are out there with them can really start to investigate them um, as individuals. And there's, they are scrutinized on a daily basis, um, which is a lot of pressure in itself. Um, and a lot of people voluntarily withdraw from this process equally the, the, the Hills process before also. Um, and so that's the six weeks. Um, it, it's, I think it's fair to say post this period of the selection, if you're performing well on the whole, people will be successful right to the end of the six month process. There's a, there is a number of courses that they have to do. And there's a number of pinch points where people can still ultimately be unsuccessful in the process. Um, Again, these are library pictures, but there's a there's a resistance to interrogation phase, which I can't go into any detail around, but it's, it clearly challenges people um, to a place that they've never been challenged before. They've been on the run for a number of days. They, have, they haven't et, et cetera. Um, they are not high performance, optimized performers at that stage. And then they're put through the mill uh, for a number of days uh, of interrogation. Um, again, to really test their resolve, their resilience, their character, et cetera. Um, because ultimately the career that they're going to be faced with, those two pictures probably summarize the, the breadth of uh, experiences that they're going to be involved in. And whilst on the face of it, they look you know, pretty sexy pictures to people looking at the military, um, it's a very real reality of the kind of uh, operations and methods of getting to where people need to get to within these operations. And, and there are inherent challenges in each of the 
the, the day's activities that they'll be asked to do. Therefore, what we have to ensure we've got is the right person to start loading up and, and building on their careers. Clearly, um, every day is a school day and there's a, there's a very steep learning curve when people turn up with this potential so that the fresh guys out of the selection process um, are jumping on a very fast moving train um, and they have to hang on. And again, we can talk around uh, the things we build into the process there to ensure that they're, they're performing and, and staying on that, on that train. Um, so I guess that's an overview of the recruitment process as the, as the lead recruiter, I guess one of the jobs I failed to mention is, um, you know, we, we don't have to sell the job very hard, as you can probably imagine. Um, with, you know, I, I had some, um, stop this share now. Um, I had some success with um, being the lead recruiter, I think, again, with my own kind of, this is me speaking now, and some of the feedback that I got around, um, I think we used to think you could just uh, wave this wave this flag and people would naturally be attracted, and, and I think they are. Um, but one of the important factors to remember is that around 95% of people that start this process are going to fail. And so with that comes an awful lot of doubt from people that start. And I can relate to that. As when I first started that process, there was not a single bone in my body that was like, I'm definitely going to finish this course. My thoughts were, I'm going to face this challenge and um, I'm going to see how I fare. Um, I'm really keen and determined to give it a go, but let's just see what happens. Um, and I can understand that, that doubt that uh, initial candidates can have. So I think some of the successes we had was building that relationship, building that trust of saying, look, we were just like you. This isn't about us expecting you to be the finished article. We know you're going to start that process with some <coughs> massive doubts. And uh, we're here to, to kind of mentor you through that uh, program if, if that's what you want. Uh, and some people don't need it. And that's fine, too. You know, I don't think I had that. Uh, mentorship myself um, again we can talk around why that may or may not be the case and I was successful but um, um, some people do and I think it's a common thing now for people to maybe need a little bit more of that role model mentorship kind of a style of, of, of assistance shall we say so yeah I guess that's the that's the process for me Fantastic. That's a, a great overview there Gary. I'm not sure whether Chris is uh, happy with uh, putting you into bat now um, I'm sure there's, yeah, the class of 92 have got some great tales, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, yeah, you may not have some images to, to match that in terms of the process at, at Salford, Chris. No, and I think it just goes to emphasise, um, you know, the, the industry that we're in. Obviously, you know, Gary's uh, background and, and work, etc. that you're actually recruiting for people to actually save lives. And, you know, the, we're in a... We're in a, a sporting industry where we're looking at a lot on performance, um, but obviously the people that Gary and you know the, the the special forces are looking to to recruit are looking for people, um, you know, with the. I'd like to think, <clears throat> I'd like to think that they are crossovers, and I'll come to the hopefully what will, what will be the crossovers. That's why I was very interested in doing the the event itself and. You know, even when I was at the Premier League, getting involved and looking at military and elite performance, not just in military, but in other industries, uh, education, um, the arts, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, Royal Shakespeare Company performance. There's a lot of, I think there's a, a lot of crossovers in elite performance um, and characteristics of elite performers. Uh, and hopefully, like I say, I'll, I'll come to that. But I mean, it's 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 fascinating. Like I say, when you you're actually recruiting for people to, um, you know, to go into those kind of places and get get tested, uh, you know, to, to extremes. I'm sure, like they they like they are doing. And um, like I say, at the end of the day, we're playing football, <laughs> playing football. <clears throat> we think we're putting the pressure, playing in front of fifty thousand people, etc. Blah blah blah. I would imagine it's a different kind of a pressure what um, you know the the, the special forces uh, uh, you know, have to have to endure and and uh, and have experienced. But um, yeah, if I can, I'll I'll just share the screen and um, just put this up uh, one second. Um, Thank mm -hmm. you. 
can you see that now? Yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> we, we've been, we, we took the, the club's been, um, the club's been full time for three years. Uh, before that, Salford City was a, a tradi traditional um, amateur club um, playing in the, the lower tiers of, uh, of non-league football, uh, tier 8, tier 9, tier 10, uh, which is a long way down the pyramid of, of, uh, of the football. Obviously, if you're starting at the top with the Premier League, and then you've got the Championship, League 1, League 2, and then you, you're into the Conference, the National League, and then um, you know the, the, the local non-league uh, leagues, so to speak. Um, so when I first went in there, we were in Conference North, uh, and the club were transitioning from part-time to full-time in June 2017. I joined in January 2017. So, um, like I said, the, the, the transition from going from a part-time to a full-time club, uh, the training ground, the training facilities, the actual uh, ground itself, um, <clears throat> were, 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 were massive, really, for a, for a size of the club of Salford City. Um, but the plans were in place to, to move forward and move forward quickly. Um, and to, 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 to get to where we've got to so far has been a challenge. It's been a, a really exciting challenge and one which has been fascinating and I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I think one of the things that, well, the, one of the main things that we've had to look at is the recruitment of the players, is the recruitment of the staff. Um, and as it as it changed over the over the over the years it probably has it was it was the, the first year we had to win promotion the second year we had to get out of the national league um and did we get it right no i don't think we did but we've learned a lot of lessons over the over the course of those three years um and in 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 this transfer window um we try to focus our recruitment on two things and one is the characteristics of the player and the experience of the player. Now, that's not to say that, you know, we're, we're just looking for experienced 27, 28, 29 year olds. We're actually looking for, for, a, for a mixture of characters, um, a, sorry, a mixture of players who have got the characteristics, characteristics, characteristics to win, um, but also as well, the, they've got some experience of, of, of playing in the league. I, w I think the year before we were, possibly a little bit too loyal to the players that have got us promotion. They'd got us so far and we thought that we could go again uh, from, from the National League to, to challenge in League Two. Um, and it, they were, it was 100% right to give those players a, an opportunity. Uh, but we felt that after round about Christmas time, we had to make some changes and we brought in five or six players in the January transfer window that really did give us that experience and that know-how of playing in League Two and playing in league football. Um, so what we're looking for and what we've looked for in this transfer window specifically at first team level, and I'll come on to the development squad in a minute, but when we're looking at the... Um, the, the, the players that we've looked to recruit at the first team level, one is character. So if we go through the players, and, and they're out there, so I'm not talking, you know, you know, I'm not giving any secrets away, but the likes of uh, Jason Lowe, the likes of um, Tom Clark, Darren Gibson, Ian Henderson, um, they've all got a certain character. They've all got experience. They've all got a background. They've all got a, a background of um uh, of, of, of a way that we want to play, which I think you've got to have an identity, which is massively important. You've got to understand the way that you want to play, how are you going to play, and then bring in the players that are going to help you play in that way. That's part of the sporting director's role to be able to identify those players. Um, so I think, you know, like I say, as far as the um, as far as the first team recruitment's concerned, that's that's been a big. Uh, a big focus on us this year and like I say we didn't we didn't go into furlough we, we, we carried on working throughout the um, uh, throughout the lockdown uh, and we've got a lot of a lot of our business done so basically what we do is and the way that we recruit we work with we work with two systems one is uh, Scout 7 uh, which is a 
it's a database it's a it's a way of um, we collect all our information and store our information uh, and data um, and also we work with a, a company called scout seven that actually uh, allows us and gives us the opportunity to watch um, to watch our targets uh, when we're actually um, you know when we've, we've decided which areas we're, we're, we're looking to we're looking to, uh, to, to to recruit him on the sub on that side of things on the on the slide there on the left hand side um, we talked before about subjectivity objectivity our scouts we've, we've just brought in now a, um, a data recruitment analyst that will have access to an awful lot of data on players which we think is very very important and I think football's going down that route now of a lot more data focused recruitment um, but I still think there has to be that subjectivity I, I still think there has to be that scout that goes out and actually we we've got our player profiles which I've, I've I've um, um, dulled out there so you can't see them, but we mark our, we, we have a player profile for every position. Then we get our scouts to mark them out of 10 in those certain areas. And then we come to a certain decision. Um, that is run first and foremost by myself. Uh, I work with the head of scouting, Greg Strong. Uh, he has a number of scouts who works, who works underneath him. And that, that information comes back to us um, and myself and Greg speak on a, a regular occasion, probably daily uh, and meet very regularly as well. And then we present the final um, final outcomes, I suppose you'd say, to, to the manager. Um, and ultimately we sit down and discuss what we found uh, and obviously the areas that we're looking to, uh, to recruit in. Um, and then we put together a target list of three possibly four really good targets but they have to be realistic as well we've made the we've made the mistake last uh, in 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 certain years of having unrealistic targets that just weren't it weren't uh, achievable so to speak they were still under contract that have cost money um they might have even wanted to come to play in league two etc so there is a lot of background goes into it and a lot of due diligence goes into it before we actually put together a final target list for myself and the manager to go through. Um, and then we start the recruitment process of speaking to the players, speaking to the players' agents to see if they're interested, see if they want to come to Salford City uh, and, and, and play in League Two, but part of something exciting, hopefully, which is going to be, like I say, moving forward at a rapid rate. And have they got the personality to be able to deal with that as well, which I think is very, very important, um, you know, because we've had players in the past that on paper would have seemed to have filled that criteria, but actually when it comes to it, it's actually been a little bit too much for them. Um, so how do we how do we stop doing that? How do we avoid those kind of mistakes really? And I think having the experience of playing at this uh, a level, we always try and recruit for a level above now. So they've actually played in League One. Most, all our team, we played a game yesterday, all of our team have played in League One now. So, you know, they have no problem in playing big games in, in, in League Two. Um, <clears throat> and some people out there might, might scoff and think, are the big games in League Two when you look at the Premier League games? Yeah, because <clears throat> the players are playing at this level, but, um, you know, for a reason. Some have played in the Championship. So they have experienced big, big games in front of big crowds. So they should be able, should be able to handle these kind of experiences and this kind of, uh, of, of, of pressure. So like I said, that's the, that's the recruitment the scouting process, use of various uh, methods to manage the players. Uh, like I say, Scout 7 and, and, and Y Scout. So from a long list, we then draw up a, a short list, uh, watch and create reports on players highlighted and filter further, filter reports, um, into interested potential signings, compile the data, video and live reports on players. So we actually go out and watch the players. It's important that you can watch as many live games as, as, as possible. The video sometimes. One of the things we actually really, really focus on, as daft as it sounds, we get to this, we want all our scouts, me, me, uh, me as well. We like to get to the, to, to the game half an hour, 40 minutes before the kickoff. 
for the simple reason to watch the player that we play that we're we're recruiting or scouting, should I say, to watch him in a warm up, to see what he's like in a warm up, what's his body language like, uh, is he engaged, what's he like with the other players, is he you know is he is he uninterested, etc. Blah blah blah, which will will have a big impact on his performance. So that, that's the the level of detail that we go into. Obviously, we will look at his playing history, his injuries. And also, as well, we have signed players on the back of the. Uh, sorry, we have not signed players on the back of their social media use. Um, you know, so again, part of the process, part of that um, recruitment process, is to look at their what they what they like on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. And if they come out with anything, um, you know, untoward or that's going to be derogatory to the club or the game itself then uh, we, we, we don't sign them. We don't sign them. We see that as a, a failure. Uh, sorry. Nah. We see that as a flaw in their, in their characteristic, in their, uh, in their character, should I say, sorry. Um, and then, like I say, we get the staff together to decide whether to, to sign the, the player subject to a medical, which is, is the final part of the process. Um, you know, again, this year, uh, we, we had a player come in uh, that we did sign, uh, but after his, uh, after his medical, it was, uh, the, you know, it, it, it was left to the decision, you know, is this player worth the risk because of his injury uh, history and uh, and the medical? And he was deemed it was. Um, so again, it's it's using the data at your that's available to you uh, in a in a in a in a way which actually informs you. It doesn't actually make decisions. Ultimately, data does not make decisions for us. Ultimately, it still has to be a subjective decision uh, whether to bring the player in or not. Right. So yeah, that's our that's our scouting process. Um, and ju I'll just go back to I'll just go back to that slide. Um, sorry got a new computer and it's <laughs> taking time to get used to things so we've we've actually um brought in a, a development squad now which um has already it, it, we, we brought it in last year and it's run by a guy called warren joyce warren was very successful with man united's under 23 he's had a successful playing career etc um it was actually the uh, the coach to bring uh, Marcus Rashford through, Paul Pogba through, uh, and, and lots of other players that actually went on to play for, for other clubs as well. But his, his record was was second to none. Um, he was actually working for Melbourne City and he came back. To, uh, and when this role became available, he actually applied for it uh, in the, in, through the proper process. And, you know, it, just because he'd been at Man United, he didn't just pick the phone, you know, the, uh, the phone up and try and get a favour. He actually went through the proper process, which sums the guy up really. He's, he's a very, um, very loyal and, um, you know, as far as values and standards are concerned, he sets the highest of standards and, and values and, and demonstrates them on a daily basis. So having Warren in to work with the development squad, which is actually like a B team squad really, which uh, feeds the first team. Um, Brentford have been doing it for a lot longer than us and a lot further down the line with us but we, we do really like that model of um, a B team mirroring what the first team are doing so basically any time a player steps out of the first team through injury, through lack of form through a transfer etc you've actually got a ready made replacement in uh, in the B team ready to, ready to step in um, so last year we brought in we, we started that um, and it was it was the first year and we were very successful with it because a guy called Brandon Asante, who'd left uh, MK Dons, he played, he was only 19, played in the first team, got experience and through whatever reason, didn't get offered another contract. Uh, it came to us in the development squad, worked with Warren for three or four months. Uh, Warren's very, um, 
he, he puts a lot of importance on the physical side of things, which is, you know, it, being at Man United, you probably think it'd be the other way around, but it's not. It, it puts a lot of emphasis uh, and importance on developing the physical side of players, which also ultimately results in the mental resilience as well of, of players. Um, so Brandon had three or four months with Warren. Then he was ready for the first team and he went into the first team and, and did very well. And now he's a first team regular. So, you know, that, that kind of, on, on very little money as well. So that kind of story uh, we're looking to recreate all the time. And this year we've had over 60 trialists come in um, who, um, let me just go back to that. Sorry. Sorry, that was a slide I was looking for. Following the success of Brandon from last year, we're focusing on the development score for this year. So uh, that's the, we've had over 50 trialists. We've got some more trialists coming in this week. So that's the, that's the process um, that we, uh, you know, we're looking to, to replicate on a more regular basis this year. And hopefully we can get another Brandon Asante through uh, or even, you know, a couple to actually, you know, re really, replicate what's going on at first team level we've offered five contracts so far from those 50 uh, 50 players do we go into the same kind of things that Gary that Gary would do with the special forces in a footballing context yeah because we test the lads on a, from a physical perspective obviously technically and tactically but mentally as well it's tough when they come in it's not just a matter of um, you know just playing games and, and things like that they are given physical tests and the other thing as well, Warren does really well uh, and the other scouts, they get to know the players, um, they get to know the background, they get to know the story because every player that will come into that uh, development trial, so to speak, will have some kind of a story. They might have left their club because um, change of manager, they might have had an injury, they might have fallen out of love with the game, motivation, etc. So there, there will be a story and you know, with, with Brandon, it was, um, you know, the, the the coach was looking, was probably at the time at MK Dons, was probably playing him out of position, thought he was a different type of a player to what we actually saw him as. Uh, and, you know, the football's a matter of opinions and he didn't get a, he didn't get a contract on the back of it. So, like I say, everybody's got a story and, um, you know, we've got to dig deep, really deep in, into finding out the characteristics, what these players are actually like. Then you're looking at a resilience. We, we, we think resilience is massively important. You know, have they got that that characteristic in them that when you know a run get a five minute run, for example, we, we do them these kind of tests a lot. When it gets tough, what are they like? We saw one lad. He turned up, and I was talking to the manager. He actually kind of ran really quickly past me and the manager, and he was like, "Oh, he's impressive." And then the next minute, he turned the corner, would cut the corner, walked, and was looking about to see who was watching him. So he, he's cheated in that, which is he's not going to be, be any good for us. So all the time, you're looking for characteristics. Obviously, from a technical and tactical perspective, you're looking can they can they cope with the demands uh, of what the first team are actually looking for and the way that we're actually looking to play with our football philosophy. That's you know ultimately one of the the, the, the main parts of it. But on the other side of it, have they got the characteristic? Have they got the the personality? Have they got the the values? Have they got the standards to be able to to become a player for Salford City? Um, and ultimately, the, the the two go hand in hand. If you've got one without the other, it just doesn't work. So we place an awful lot of emphasis on you know the develop uh, uh, on what the character of the player is actually like, um, and can they actually handle the pressure of playing. Um, you know, for for an elite club, um, you know, in a, in a in a in a highly pressurized situation. Right, thanks a lot for that, Chris. That's uh, fantastic. Um, I think certainly we'll sort of focus on that development squad area of, of your recruitment. I think for the for the rest of the show, I think that kind of dovetails really nicely with uh, with the um, selection process. Gary uh, explained to us through the, the special forces. Um, I think sort of, yeah, bringing it back to Gary then. Um, I think, yeah, we sort of focus now more specifically then on those intangibles. I think Chris sort of brought up one that a lot of people in the special forces I know bring up and everywhere in football is a key one, resilience. 
Um, I think I'll sort of throw in another one I saw here increasingly these days seems to be adaptability. Um, would they be the two main areas you're looking at? Are there other sort of characteristics you look at as well when you're in that sort of recruitment process or selection process for yourselves? So, <clears throat> so I guess the, the, the answer is well, there's going to be no surprises here. You know, we, we're looking at all of the characteristics that you can you can ideally want. I was fortunate enough a couple of years ago to be invited out to, to Wharton um, University in Philadelphia, number one business school uh, in the world, allegedly. And uh, one of the professors there was bringing teams of elite performers together, like Chris mentioned earlier on. Um, you know, I was there representing UKSF. Um, the Navy SEALs were there, NASA were there, Google there. And we all did this tabletop exercise. Well, what are the guys and girls that you're looking for? What are the characteristics that we've got? And it will be no surprise to you. We're all looking for the same kind of people. The, the list that I give you now, whether it's courage, humility, resilience, uh, teamwork, leadership skills, all these things are, are the qualities that we all want. But the, the critical thing is, well, how do you recognize them? And what's, what do you recognize as a as a, a good standard of humility and and how do you um, ensure that your biases aren't um, influencing your decision making too much and and that's something we would focus an awful lot on so first and foremost we select people that um, to be the the, the carder and structures or to be the the directing staff on these courses you know they are experienced people first and foremost you know they're not they're not young immature um, with very little experience they're quite the opposite they are mature experienced people that have the right characteristics they are selected uh, for that role to be a directing staff member on these courses because they are a high performer within our organizations themselves so that isn't a place where we, we send uh, the, the weaker people um, so that's first that's critical um, they then go on a number of courses before they would uh, take up that position and uh, and, and part of that on, onboarding, if you like, onto the course, onto the team, um, you know, it's critical that we create this common language, you know, so, so what does a two out of 10 in courage look like? Let's spend some time talking about what a two out of 10 looks like. Let's spend some time understanding what a six out of 10 looks like and what does a nine look like? And so, you know, as, and there's, there's people, the senior members of the, the team that are in charge of ensuring that that kind of, um, common language is clearly understood um, so that you don't get someone coming in and say right this is my chance to come thrash a few people actually they're intelligent guys and they understand that the, 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 the sausage factory of people that are uh, volunteering to go onto this course within that is the rich talent that these uh, our organizations absolutely need to thrive so there's that common understanding um, so I think the, the the key one is the is the communication and, and it's that common language of what uh, those those attributes are and ensuring we give people plenty of opportunities and experiences within the process as is six months long remember so you know even if you just take the first two and a half three months um, which is the most intense part they are each candidate is is thrown into an environment and into situations where they are new experiences and they are heavily watched, managed, like Chris mentioned. Um, the character for us is by far uh, the most important quality that we're looking for. Um, and the, the director staff that are on there um, ultimately are from the teams and they have to feel that that person is going to fit in their team. Um, now, there's, there's naturally going to be biases in there. Equally, those biases are really important because the situations that the directing staff and uh, the team guys are going to be working in um, are it's critical that people bond it's critical that people get on you know genuinely high performing teams um, you know have to bond and be tight and it doesn't mean that everybody has to like each other all the time but we have to have these common values and common principles and to be bought into that uh, and to recognize that in the in the people that are coming through you know the, the ethoses of the unit are heavily leaned on the special forces ethos is humility is one of the, the critical things which you know, some people back in my old organizations will probably scoff at me being on a on a call like this where i'm talking about this because part of um the organization is well humility is key i genuinely try and give this information because i think there's a lot to be learned that 
humility um, in, in elite sport um, is, is probably one of the qualities that lacks the most because of the rewards that you can get from being the outspoken um, and being the, the front man, if you like, and being the lead man. Well, when you're playing a team game and you're playing a team game where lives are on the line, that's not the quality that you want. You want the guys that are bought in, they're humble and, and know that they're, you know, the, the key identifying difference of a team versus a group, well, a team relies on each other. And, and that's the important quality that we look for, these humble people that can work together to, to solve these complex problems. Um, naturally, discipline. We, you know, I joined the Marines and I, I wasn't the most disciplined people. I was taught discipline and I was disciplined a lot a lot and uh, I, I have become self-disciplined that's what we're looking for you know we're looking for people that when they're not being watched like this, what chris mentioned uh, they're doing the right thing when no one's watching that's the person we want and we're giving them scenarios we're putting them in situations where they think they're not being watched a lot but they are being watched and we're watching them and we're reporting on them and we're assessing them and making these excuse me <clears throat> making these decisions on them so um, and finally the, the, the so just to be clear, the SF ethos is humility, discipline, humour, and, and probably most importantly, the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. So we're looking for those people that are prepared to get on that train, like I, I mentioned before, and, and go with it and keep learning. And I noticed we'll come on to it, I'm sure, one of the questions about pressure and you know, certain experience can put people under undue pressure. Well, we want people that can deal with pressure. Um, we want people that can deal with an immense amount of pressure. Um, and that unrelent unrelenting pursuit of excellence will force you to adapt, like we've already mentioned, and will force you to uh, make changes to how you're doing things now so that you can uh, face and deal better with maybe next time the situations that you're faced with. Okay, fantastic. Also for, you, for yourself, Chris, at Salford, sort of probably just initially just to identify what are those kind of key kind of subjective characteristics that you're looking to identify in players that are either sort of key things that make you think yeah he's for us or yeah maybe not i, I mean I, I totally agree with gary about having the the humility we, we we've spoke to one lad um in, in the uh, who was on trial and he's back his story was that he's been released from his club he's 19 years old um he, he is a good player we do like him um the 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 situation was at his club that he actually the, the coach changed and with that you know he wanted to play in a different way etc blah 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 we asked the lad what happened at the club and he didn't make any excuses he just said you know the, the coach didn't fancy me um you know that's life I've got to get on with it uh, uh, you know and, and a, a lot of people a lot of kids would have made the excuse well you know the coach is this and you know, my face didn't fit, etc. Blah blah blah, and you know, he actually it was very, very uh, reasonable, reasonable about why he'd been released. He'd got that humility to understand that that's the game. That's football's about opinions, no hard feelings. Um, you know, and I think when you get people like that and those kind of characters, that you know, like I said, there's a there's a background to all of these lads. The most most important thing is that humility to 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 accept that you know life's not fair you know I, I lost my career when I was 24 that took a lot of getting over but I've got to the stage now where that's the hand I was dealt with and it's not going to change and I've got to get on with it some of my other peers and some of my, my friends didn't finish till they were 38 40 you know but that's life and you've just got to you've got to dealt, you know deal with the hand that you dealt with no excuses we, we try we, we have a, a no excuse um, policy that you know there, there are no problems you know all, the, there's only there's only problems if you if you if you create a problem if there's a an issue to be fixed then let's fix it let's sort let's sort the issue out let's not moan and groan about the problems um you know and, and like i say we're, we're a very new club and installing those principles and, and and values into new members of staff as well this is the way that we work it does take time but i think we've got a culture now that that has those those standards and those values and the other thing the other thing that we are absolutely uh, 100% uh, focused on is the relentlessness of, of the people involved and it comes from it comes from the background of like I say working with the manager uh, Sir Alex 
he didn't just want to win one league. He wanted to win 15 leagues, which he won off 13, 14 leagues. He was always planning for the next success, for the next trophy, for the next season. Yeah, you, 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 enjoyed, uh, you enjoyed your success. Didn't last very long because you were always looking to the next, to the next, um, to the next league, to the next season, etc. And we're looking for that kind of trait in our players. We want to win. We want to. We want to run past people. But we want to run past them again. We want to score two goals. We get two goals. We want to score three goals. Get three goals. We want to score four, five, six. We don't stop. And that goes for anything. That goes for in our training. That goes for the young lads when they go to. Go to a college on a on a Thursday and or on a Wednesday afternoon. I said to them the other day, well, at the end of the day, you're not here to go to college or whatever, blah blah. And probably not what you enjoy, etc. Yeah, you want to play football, you want to train, you want to play games, but this is a part of your test. This is a part of your character that if it's something that you might not enjoy doing, you might not want to do, but I'm looking at you to see if you do your best. Do your best. And they'd be different. We've got nine or ten lads in each age group, uh, 16, 17. And you'll all be different academically. You'll all be at different levels. And some will get better grades than others. But I, but I want to see who actually goes out there and does their best in, a, in, a, in an environment and an experience that you're not really particularly bothered about. Because so that's the real test of character. I think it's really important that, you know, like I say, you're always looking at players. You're always judging them, like Gary was saying. You're... In, in, at a time when they don't think they're being assessed, I think that's really important. With with the with these trials, we've put them in, we've put them in um, uh, accommodation, and I'm always asking who's looking after the kit. Can they look after themselves, or are, are, you, are you having to, you know, modicol them all the, all the time? Can they make decisions? Are they independent decision makers? Can they, when the when the uh, you know the the pressure's really on in a game. Will that player be able to make a clear decision under pressure? Will they be looking to other people? Will they be waiting to get what uh, to be told what to do? Because unfortunately, in football these days, and, and academy football especially, we have created, I think, a very robotic, very um, sterile system. I think where players. Like I say, even in in young players, eight, nine, ten years old, they get the kit, they get told what to do, they get told when to do it, they get told how to do it. There's no decision making process for them, and that's what we've have that's what we we're different with at Salford. They do get left to their own devices, they do get left to sort problems out for themselves. We have brought in um members of the Royal Military Police, um, um to, to give them challenging days and test them physically and mentally. Um, you know, I think, it's, I think that's really important, but all the time you're looking at these characters, have they got the, have they got the character and personality when the big games on and when the pressure's on, are they going to be able to stand forward? Are they going to be able to make a clear decision without anybody else or, or, or without waiting to get an instruction from the manager without waiting for an instruction from another player are we looking for those have we got those leaders in our team and it starts from a young age um, and like I say I think in the academy system now we've created probably many professionals I think it's fair to say I, and I, when I was at the Premier League I looked at a lot of 13, 14, 15 year old lads at tournaments etc strutting around like they've got 100 games under the belt if they're not they're not, and we've created that, and you know we we did that at the Premier League, and there's a lot a lot of good things come out of the Triple P, but I think in the with young players, and I think it's probably not just football. I think it's probably society in itself where we do a lot of things for children, we do a lot of things for young people, but at the end of the day, we're only making their lives more difficult in the long run because they can't make decisions for themselves. That you know, and I think it's important that we recognise that from an early age that we give. Again, at the Premier League, we did a lot on growth mindset. Um, there's a, a, a lady called Carol Dweck who really, um, she, she, it's, it's fascinating stuff about challenging people, challenging, you know, Gary, you'll be doing this all the time, challenging your, your, your recruits and things like that, the people that you're looking to bring in, giving them, giving them obstacles, making sure that, you know, they've got a decision to make. Did they, did they accept the challenge? 
will they accept, you know, will they, will they take on a five minute run? If they don't and they cut corners and they cheat, and all, they're of no use to us whatsoever. But if you challenge them again and challenge them, will they take that, have they got that growth mindset? Again, it's, it's a big part of what we're about. Um, but like I say, I think, you know, the humility, the discipline and the relentlessness is, is key to us. So to bring you, you back in there, Gary, obviously you're uh, nodding away at some of the things that sort of Chris has, has picked up uh, on. Um, and so tie us in with the sort of question that Darren Sutton has, uh, has sort of mentioned that obviously we sort of identified some of those specific intangibles. Um, again, then how we, you start to go about measuring those things. Um, see things like you say uh humility you know imagine with sort of a lot of young lads who are going out there and looking to prove themselves that can be can be a hard thing to 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 measure in in the situations you're putting them in yeah 100 percent. and um this isn't going to be a, a an uncommon problem to everybody listening um you know how you measure those intangibles but uh this is where um again as we were speaking right at the beginning, we were talking around trust. You know, we we trust and put trust in the uh, instructors that we have, have handpicked to be in these key positions that are making these assessments. Uh, now, we've got a very, um, again, I can't go into the detail, but we've got a very um, um, fair, I think is the right word, fair way of, of making these um, subjective decisions and we and we just use conversation so we'll we'll have every single night um specifically out in out in the jungle phase there will be a a chat and we'll we'll speak about each candidate and we'll speak about what's happened and we'll ask people their opinion on what they've seen and you know we are all we can't avoid the fact that we're all biased in our thinking and we're all see what we all recognize what good looks like to us but what we do is we trust the instructors to just be honest in that we all trust each other. We're all, we want the guys that are demonstrating potential. We want the guys in, in the unit or they want the guys in the units that are going to be stood next to them in a few months time, potentially on a, on a very dangerous, uh, in a very potentially dangerous situation. And so you want to ensure that you've got the right people next to you. And so uh, there has to be uh, an element of trust on those instructors that are making these decisions based on, well, is this the person that I want next to me? And is that humility that maybe um, has been maybe a, a poor judgment in a particular situation that he may highlight to the rest of the group one evening, is that a one-off? Has anybody else seen it? Um, is, where does that sit on their radar of, well, is that important? Am I getting, am I over-focusing on this rather than kind of letting that slide because this is the first time he's been in this scenario all these kind of honest conversations that we have as a group um, and trust the instructors and again there's various different seniorities to these instructors it's not just guys from a, a, a certain part of their career there's a chief instructor that will be five or six years more senior to them they'll be the training officer that has got the most experienced person that's in that role that's probably done 15, 16 to 20 years uh, within the group that is overseeing all of his instructors and we, we have these very honest open and frank chats about each candidate and we spend time in that process we don't collect a lot of data we we do collect some there's there's various different scenarios that they're put through you know um, fitness and all that kind of uh, stuff and time speed distance on the on the hills process is all monitored and there's set specific objectives that they've got to try and meet um, and, and that's important and if people don't met meet that they're cut away and um, that's the process but when it comes to the subjective qualities we have trust on the instructors to have these open and honest chats and I'm not going to sit here and say that it's it's always a particularly smooth ride you know but that's you know the, the guys have to have these chats and sometimes we bang heads on certain characters and certain um, incidents because because we're all different and we have different opinions as to what that means and that's why it has to be mediated with various different people to uh ensure that the person the candidate being assessed is getting a fair a fair assessment i think one final thing to kind of note on that there will be a stage where the most senior person in each of the respective units the commanding officer comes out and just sees how things are going on and has his kind of halfway or three-quarter way assessment of like feedback of where are we at with this where with this process he's got trust in his instructors to be having this this um, thorough process 
and then he'll go back and busy man uh, each unit respectively with what's going on globally but then at the end of this process again they'll often um, be fed back the information and, and ultimately the final decision will, will lie with them based on what their uh, delegated instructors have, have, have come back to them with as far as reports. I'm sure Chris will have a, a couple of questions uh, to ask you around around how that process and structure comes together. I just wanted to double check with what that you say with the instructors. The instructors will, all of them have come from a background where they would have been through this process themselves. 100%. Also serving within unit posts. So they know it's almost like, well, we'll be taking some of these guys and these will be my colleagues out in the field. Yeah, 100%. As far as the directing staff or the instructors are concerned, every single one of them has been through that process themselves. So they understand what, it like, what it's like for the candidates to be. Um, conscious that time has passed for a few of them. And so you, you, when something's particularly challenging, you quite often remember it's slightly different to how it actually is, right? But uh, um, yeah, they'll all have been through that process themselves and have a certain num number of years, no, no less than four or five years within the units, um, actually doing the job that they're assessing people for. Um, there are a number of external people that will come in, maybe doctors, maybe psychologists that will come in and, and uh, be able to comment and offer some thoughts and opinion for that external um, look. But the, the, the way to the decision massively lies with the instructors and ultimately the training officer that's overseeing that training. With that assessment of these intangibles and we're sort of looking at their humility, their drive, you're sharing subjective opinions is there a, a place where this is then put into a report where you are giving those marks out of yeah, five ten you're sort of yeah you're giving a uh, absolutely and this is what I, right at the beginning of that section I, I spoke about having a common language and so we spend an awful lot of time ensuring that that common language is correct and everybody that's doing the assessing understands that common language so that a two out of ten in let's say humility is understood is this a person a two out of ten? Well, probably not going to get too far as if he's a two out of ten. But you know, what does what does what's the difference between a five and a seven look like? That's that's important conversations, and it's you know, um, and it's important that the instructors are all singing off the same song sheet um, before they even get into the jungle. So they at least you know, and they are constantly reminded. People need to be reminded more than they need to be. Uh, uh, told right you can be told right no it's important to not you're assessing for potential you're assessing for potential this is the key thing that we're looking for we're not looking for the finished article so that it's like i said it's not always a smooth process it's it takes um some pretty heated debate sometimes um but that that's all for the better of the uh the candidates and the fair assessment Okay, Chris, um, so you we sort of mentioned you said you've got about 50 trialists coming through looking for spots on the, on the development squad. So you're putting them through their, through their paces. We sort of wonder if they can try and put your model and see where it sort of dovetails there then with what Gary's just explained. So obviously you have the instructors will be the coaches, you've got the scouts who are sort of putting in their, their opinions. How, how are those conversations, how is that rating of players in terms of uh, their characteristics, these kind of subjective opinions you're having on the plays. How, how is how are those opinions being shared amongst your decision making group? I would think it's a very similar process, Steve. To be fair to what Gary's explained there, um, the 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 scouts obviously uh, will 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 bring the the trialists in. They'll be watched. We'll play them in games. Um, Obviously, the coach, Warren, will work with them. The first team manager will watch them because ultimately, if the manager can't see him playing for the first team, it's, you know, and that will be the final decision process that, that Gary spoke to there. Um, you know, with the, I think it was the commanding officer, did you say Gary comes in at the end? Um, you know, the manager has to see him and we have to see. That's where our relationships and trust that Gary spoke about there, I have to trust the scouts and the coach, Warren, to know what a Salford City player looks like. And I think from my perspective, that's part of my role when I actually am bringing, uh, you know, members of staff, do they actually get what we're actually looking to achieve? Do they actually understand what a Salford player looks like? 
and there's a lot of conversation goes on and um, informally as well. And I'm not, I'm not. I call them corridor conversations. They have to take place. I don't like them as part of the decision making process because I think they can. I think everybody should be part of that. Um, you know, and, and uh, we've got a, a WhatsApp group and all the rest of it, which is actually useful at times, very useful at times for, for communicating and things like that. But then we will sit down all together uh, to discuss before we actually go to the manager, because like I say, ultimately we, we have to put people in front of him who we are confident that the manager's going to, uh, that the manager's going to fancy or would actually select for the first team at some stage. Would they be ready to go in? There's probably, there's probably two different levels there's one, you're a Santi, which is probably a couple of months, Brendan Asante, I mentioned before, probably a couple of months away from going into the first team, is near enough ready to go into the first team. Or there's the one that, you know, you're looking physically. He's got all the attributes technically, tactically. He's resilient. He's got, um, you know, he's got the humility. But physically, he's just not quite ready for the first team. We'll give him that time to develop. Um, but those traits and those values and those characteristics that Gary mentioned about, you know, the, the, the trust with the staff, do the players, do the, you know, the players that we're actually looking at, do they have the characteristics that we are confident will be able to, will be able to survive uh, and thrive in a first team environment. Um, you know, and, and a, a lot, a lot of that is, um, is the trust that I put into Warren, especially getting to know the player. Mm. If he turns around and says, if Warren turns around and says, listen, he's got all the ability in the world, but he keeps tossing it off. He keeps, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't listen. He's not taking information on board. He's, he's not engaging, blah, blah, blah. You, you can actually work with that, but you actually, you've probably not got a lot, you've not got six months like, you know, with, with, with what the, with what Gary um, deals with there, we've only got a couple of weeks to actually make an assessment. Could we actually make a difference? Is it, what's the reason for that player being like that? Could we actually change him, or are we wasting our time? And ultimately, we've got to make a quick decision within, like, say, the space of two weeks. So, if we do see an improvement in those areas, then we we we, we would probably go with it. But if there's no improvement, and you know, the the rest of it is really good. But there is a flaw in his character. Ultimately, he's going to let us down. Ultimately, he'll let the team down. He'll let the club down. And anyway, I just can't take the risk, especially when I'm spending. I'm spending basically. I'm spending, you know, the owners' money, and they put the trust in me to be able to get this right. And we don't get we don't get everything right. There's no question about that. We, you know, we've not got a, a, a real long and arduous decision making process and a recruitment process to be able to go through. We have to make some snap decisions at times, I suppose. And I think gut instinct comes into that, into recruitment. Sometimes you, you, you get a feel for a player and you, you look at him and you, you speak to him, and you, you get a, uh, a connection uh, and, a, and a rapport with a player and a person that just gives you that that feeling that they're going to be a success. You know, Brandon, to be fair, Brandon was like that. Brandon, you, you knew as soon as he came in, he, he was going to be, listen, he's not, a, he's not an ultimate success because he's only played, you know, 20 games in the first team. He's got a lot of development still to come. The best thing about that is he knows that. And he's, you know, he's, he's humble enough to work extra to, through, through lockdown, to do his extra. He's come, back, he's come back in great shape, but he knows he's got to keep on improving. The other thing about him is he's got a smile on his face. How do you, how do you, you mentioned it before, Steve, how do you measure humility? I probably measure humility by, you know, if you're walking past a young player in a, in a corridor, will they actually say hello to you? I think that's really important. Have they got the personality? Now, some, some people, some young players, haven't had those experiences and they are very insular and they, they're uncomfortable when they come in, first come in. But we want to see an improvement in them. We want to, you know, us as staff have to go out of our way to ensure that that player can develop those traits, can develop that humility. You know, like we, we have a thing. I, I see it a lot in academies where young players go over and shake the coach's hand all the time. Is there any 
compassion in that? I don't know. Is it just a habit that they do, or actually, is that is that a trait that they've actually got got in their, you know, in them as a person? I, I don't know whether it's forced on them or not. I don't know. Um, but I think a player coming over and saying hello to a coach and you know having a conversation, I think they should be able to do that. Um, and actually, like I say, I think you know being humble enough to say hello, shake hands, etc. I think it's part of the process that you're looking for. Have they got the, you know, would you want to work with that player as well? Um, it does, it does, it is still very subjective. Don't get me wrong. You know, you might get a player on an off day that's had a bad, bad morning, etc. blah, blah, blah. So you've got to be careful. And that's where you trust in your coach who has got those conversations with that player day in, day out becomes very, very important. And ultimately you're looking at him to say, yeah, would this player, and we'll, we'll all have our, our opinions, more so on the technical and tactical side, but that coach will know the player physically, mentally, te- technically and tactically, um, you know, and, and ultimately the, that's where the, the, the decision-making process kind of comes to, comes to the, the, the point, really. I mean, on personality, you could suggest, you know, um, psychometric testing and things like that. And I know there's, uh, this, this team testing, the Belbin test and things like that. I'm not 100% sure. I don't think they're very accurate at times. Um, I, I think I think ultimately, like I say, what Gary said there, having the trust in the, in the people that's making the decisions is is the most important thing. Yeah, that brings back nicely. Uh, then, Gary, I mean, like, there's lots of tests you can do, but ultimately, you know, how they, like you say, how are they going to get on with the team that you're putting them into? I think that is where the, the key decision is made when it comes to making a decision on on those individuals. How are well, they going yeah. to how are they going to react? How are they going to interact with the people you're putting with and, and how are they gonna you know, what how will they change that dynamic they're going into? This for for us, um, this is one of the things that I've I've given some thought to on this. Um, I think this is one of the areas where sport and I guess my old occupation differs slightly in the sense of what you've just dis- described Steve is of, of how well someone's going to fit into the team is almost all that matters you know there's 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 nothing more important than how that person's going to fit into the team nobody's too talented um, that we can just overlook um, disagreeableness shall we say um, you know I don't care how how awesome how fit, how skilled, how um, professional you think you are. If, if the rest of the guys aren't going to like you, we're going away for six months and we're living in uh, very difficult, austere environments and we need to be able to get on. And, and that's, that's critical for us. Whereas I understand with sport, that's very important. And I'm, and I'm not saying that that's hugely different, except you can handle a fair bit more, I'd imagine, disagreeableness because you're going to get a break every day after the match people are going home and most of the time in our old occupation my old occupation that would be the case too but there's sometimes that you're away for nine months and it's like well you you everybody has to be able to get on and and that's the thing that matters the most for us and it's people's um likability or character if you like that is going to make that difference yeah how, how do you like you, you take how can you sort of assess that Chris I mean I've even sort of players actually admit to this that they you know, they could be like the the alpha in a, in a group and as much as they could take 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 players on an, an amazing journey they could suck the energy out of a dressing room like that yeah I, I totally agree with Gary I think that's where uh, the, the, the military and sport you know do differ because in a in a in a team full of footballers in a dressing room, you're with you're with each other for two or three hours, and you, I've seen it so many occasions where you know players don't like each other, um, you know they, they genuinely don't get on. But the difference is, as soon as they set out onto the football pitch, then they are a team. That's you know. But when you're living together for six months, if you don't get on, then you, you, it's it'll just be a disaster. So I think the thing with that would be is, you know, the, the, the timescales that you're actually together. 
because you can put up with somebody that you 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 don't like or you know you don't get on with etc but i think that the skill of the coach and the, or the manager um you know is making sure that when the team just set out onto the pitch then they do play together as a team um and like i say i i, I don't think it would particularly work if you were having to live together for six months and have each other's back for, for six months and do you know do what Gary was doing with his team, uh, but there are a lot of instances. Uh, I'm not going to go into it. I think there's probably some famous ones out there where players genuinely don't like each other, but come you know come the come the come the kickoff, they're together as a team. I think that's massively important. Can I just can I just comment on that as well, just in the sense that um, I'm not going to stand here and and say that everybody gets on with each other all of the time there's a lot of there's a lot of fallouts there's a lot of guys that can't stand the sight of each other um there's probably a few people that couldn't stand the sight of me and that's fair enough but uh you know that that does happen that in any team environment that you know everyone's got their strengths but i think there's a threshold for that that is much higher in our sorry lower in in, in my old organization as opposed to sport i think the threshold for you know, I always, you know, you probably shouldn't name anyone sort of personally. I see some famous footballers and always think, I just don't know how he keeps getting selected for squads because you know he's trouble. Um, he's very talented and this is the, this is the difference um, of the two worlds. I think that comes as well down to uh, man management, Gary, I think. Um, you know, we had a, a player at United who came with a... Um, famous reputation, Eric Cantona. Um, you know, he it, it come as been some trouble at Sheffield Wednesday, uh, Leeds, etc. cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the manager was confident that, you know, he could put him in a, in a dressing room um, and, and man, you know, manage him uh, in particular. And to be fair, the, you know, the times that I was with, with Eric and I saw Eric, he was absolutely fantastic with the young players. He was brilliant with us. He was a great role model. He never stepped out of line with, you know, in the dressing room. He was part of the dressing room culture. Um, so it just goes to show that, like I said, sometimes the reputation, it's actually the skill of the manager getting the best out of him and man ma managing him. It, it, it was different. It was different, but you've just got to accept that. And uh, would he t it, it'd never be late for training. He set a brilliant example. Um, there was one instance when... He didn't adhere to the dress code, the same as everybody else at function. Now, whether he misinterpreted it, interpreted it or whatever, I don't know. It wasn't like him. I'll be honest with you, he didn't flaunt the rules or anything like that. Um, but normally a player would have been, you know, for that, the manager probably would have torn a strip off him, possibly fined him, etc. Because he was that good at what he did. And, you know, the manager understood that he couldn't have done that because he'd have lost the player because of his importance to the team. It was like, well, you know, Eric, you know, this is the dress code. Don't do it again. And he just held his hand and said, yeah, OK, boss, no problem. And that was it. Now, if you, like I say, possibly every other player, definitely me, if I'd have done that, the, the, <laughs> the manager would have gone mad at me. But I think just having those man management skills, I think it's really, really important. And understanding, you know, what your players actually bring into the team. And like I say, not everybody got on. There was a lot of famous, you know, incidences and, and cases in that dressing room where lads generally didn't get on but come three o'clock and every you know the, the goal was scored everybody celebrated together and those players celebrated together as though they were best mates i think it's interesting with uh, the two processes you have and the decision making if i'm correct gary i think you don't have a a maximum minimum number number of people you can take so if if the, if the person is right, we'll have them. It's either they're the right person or they're not. You're not having to decide we were only having five guys and, right, we like both these guys, which one are we having? Yeah, um, so in, in principle, that's 100% correct. Uh, the reality is that the, the process um, and the, I guess the, the, the numbers of people volunteering just isn't there to... <laughs> Put us, put them in the, put the organisations in a place where they're having to turn people away. You know, there, there's literally not enough people um, being able to pass the process to to fill the gap. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. If if there was 40 or 50 people successful in, in principle, then they would all be taken. I'm sure 
you know, fast forward three or four years of that happening every single time, then there would probably have to be some um, measures put in place to to change that. But that's not where that's not where the group is at. As as um, the world's not getting a nicer place at the end of the day, it's it's getting more dangerous, and so um, these units are being uh, asked more and more of, and therefore are probably growing in size uh, on a yearly basis now. Likewise, Chris, you were looking for a, a sort of a fine out number, or if you had, like I say, well, we got 20 really good lads here, let's take all 20, if, say, 15 was your, your cut-off point. Or do you really yeah. have a cut-off point to the point where, right, you're now having to start comparing a couple of lads in terms of, right, who's going to be the best for us here? I think at, I think at first team level, you, you're looking at a, an outfield squad of 20 maximum, possibly uh, three keepers, definitely two goalkeepers, possibly three. Um, because one, obviously, we've got a budget to stick to. You know, the, that's, that's the, the situation uh, with, on the financial side of things. But also as well, the management of those players, um, you know, and, and the coaching of those players on a, on a daily basis. Um, too many players are difficult to coach, and it's it's not right for the for the for the manager and the coaches to have to deal with players. You know, if, if you're getting up to 25, 26 players, with very it's very very difficult to to get the uh, the quality of work that you're looking to to achieve. Um, you know, in, in preparation for your game on Saturday, um, and also as well, those players. You know, obviously, there's only 18 on a match day squad. Uh, the motivation of those players is. Is not always great as well if they're not involved and they're not with the squad, etc. Um, on the development squad size, what side what we're looking at is the the gaps in the first team, possibly that you know may may need filling. Uh, that squad doesn't you know needs obviously needs to be a, a, a decent sized squad as well. But the focus is more on where's the gaps going to be in the first team. Should we get a, an injury to that player or that player? Um, so it's not there's not a finite, uh, sorry, and it's not an, a, an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of space is available. We're actually very selective in you know what we do there. Um, it does come down a lot of the time to, to the financial side of things as well. Okay, I'm sort of seeing where the time is rattling on. Just sort of last couple of questions. There's one here for you, Chris. Um, probably fits in without, like you're saying, you've given yourselves a real limited amount of time in terms of the development squad to look at players um having got rid of the academy um paul reynolds um burton albion academy is asking uh, what was the rationale behind scrapping your your academy which obviously would have given you a long time to look at players you sort of obviously got a better understanding of their characteristics if you'd have kept that academy but yeah, no, I, I, no. To be fair, we we we've we've kept the academy. We, it was something that we spoke about, um, and it got suggested in the media that we were going to get rid of the academy. But we've still got a six. To, um, we've still got a youth team, sixteens uh, to eighteens. It's a it's a lot more condensed now. It's a lot more um, focused on um, you know that that development squad is really important. You know, really important for us. But we're still very focused on the development of young players. Um, we we are running um, a, a traditional category four model, whereas in the past it was a um, you know we we we'd got a lot of staff for a, for a category four model. Uh, so we just changed the changed the um, the dynamic of the academy really, and the you know the the the, the structure around to suit is, to suit us better. Um, which which we did in the first two years. We only went under E Triple P regulations last year because we were in the football league. Um, so you know we've still got eighteen, uh, sixteen to eighteen year olds who will actually feed, will feed. Sorry, the uh, the development squad. Uh, like I say, it was something that got broken in the in the press. Um, but you know that's um, that's that's still up and running. Is the is the academy. Uh, Gary, take this one. If there was one, just one intangible that you could accurately measure, what would it be? Great question. Um, I think because again, I'm going to I'm going to say integrity. Um, 
honesty, call it what you will. Um, I think if, if that one quality was rich in every single person, then you're going to have trust, which ultimately all high performance teams need. Um, it's trust in the people around you. It's trust in the, uh, in the coaching staff. It's trust in the, the, uh, the leaders of the organization. And so, um, yeah, in, integrity is, is the one. Um, and uh, again, uh, leading back into my old experiences, it's one of the things that we would uh, often challenge people on, um, ask them a direct question and, and make it very clear to them, this was an integrity shout, have they done something or not? And, you know, even if they haven't done it, which isn't what we wanted, if they're honest about that, then that's not necessarily a black mark against the name. However, if the reverse is true and they, they don't demonstrate integrity, then um, you're not getting many marks of that against your name before uh, you're never going to pass the process. So I'd probably say integrity. And for you, Chris? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think um, having, having good people uh, doing the right things, um, I think there's a difference between doing things right and doing the, in doing the right things. I think having, um, and especially from the, from the leadership perspective as well, I think it's important that we do have good role models in the club. Um, you know, we do want to learn uh, who do who do show that integrity and that that humility as well. So I think there has to be, um, I think there has to be some focus on on you know the the, the people at the not speak much not so much the people at the top, but the you know the manager, myself, the coaches to actually set the right standards as well and show the show the players, especially the young players, especially what integrity uh, it uh, looks like as well. But yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Gary. I think that's massively important. Fantastic. Chris Casper, Gary Bamford, thanks a lot for your, your time and sharing your, your experiences with us today. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody. All the best.